Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to what is going to be the seventh episode of Emerge. Thank you very much for uh, taking the time to join us today. Um, I have with me uh, Dr. Nathan Basisti. Um, before I introduce him, just a couple of uh, usual housekeeping announcements. Um, we are recording the session. Uh, we're going to make the recordings available after a couple of days, uh, so you can uh, view it your own leisure via social media channels. Probably easiest is to access via YouTube channels. So look out for Resin Bio on there, and you have the uh, Emerge uh, playlists with all the previous episodes as well. Please post your questions in the chat box. We'll have plenty of time to uh, address this after the presentation. We also encourage uh, live discussions. So if you like to post your or ask your question uh, live, you can do so. Just uh, use the raise hand icon and I'll activate your microphone after the presentation. Um, what else? If you'd like to join us for on this platform and present your work, yeah, maybe you have some cool research in omics and proteomics uh, arena, you can do so. We're more than happy to, to provide you this platform. So please contact us at emerge at resinbio.com. Um, so before I give over the mic to Nathan, just a little bit of background on his career so far. Um, he started, uh, or he's completed his PhD at the University of Washington, where he started uh, working with mass spectrometry based workflow, workflows and applying these to study protein uh, turnover. Specifically, he was using a lot of metabolic labeling uh, approaches. In 2015, he joins uh, the Buck Institute uh, where he was uh, working with uh, Dr. Birgit Schillig as well as Dr. Judy Campesi. And again, he was focusing on age-related disorders. In this time, his work was mostly uh, looking at uh, the role of fossil threshold modifications uh, in this area. And he was applying a lot of data-independent acquisition workflows. Since he's had numerous awards, um, late, uh, the most recent one in 2020, um, he won the prestigious Pathway to Innovation Award. And I think all of these have now enabled him to um, start his own group. So he's currently based at an SDO Institute of Aging. He's a PI at a translational Giro proteomics unit. So today he's gonna to be telling us about some of his work of how he's using mass spectrometry to study the protein dynamics in relation to uh, aging and longevity and some of the novel computational approaches he's, he's developing to our 80s, uh, to 80s work. So Nathan, um, first of all, thank you very much for taking the time to present and I really look forward um, to, your, to your slide and a subsequent discussion. Okay, well, thank you very much, Stoyan. It's great to be here and I appreciate the invitation to present and um, uh, at this series. I mean, this is a great series. I've really enjoyed following the previous episodes and uh, the, the, those posted online are really, really interesting as well. So I encourage people to check those out. Yeah, so today, um, I'm gonna, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, uh, how we've developed a protein turnover tool. And I'd like to start out by uh, giving you guys a little perspective on why I think it's important to look at protein turnover, and then tell you a little bit about a novel tool we've uh, developed um, now in Skyline to, to enable people to do um, protein turnover studies. So before I get into the details, um, I just wanna do a little bit of additional introduction to myself. So. Um, I am uh, the PI of a relatively new lab at the NIA. We're called the Translational Geroproteomics Unit. And, um, you know, our lab is interested in a number of research directions. So um, primarily, so one of the first uh, things that we've, we were interested in since I've come here is developing a new generation of aging biomarkers. So um, this could be protein turnover based, but we're also talking about PTM based biomarkers here. So a lot of the large scale proteomics studies that have been done in the past, looking at um, you know, biomarkers of disease and aging, um, they're all often, especially large scale proteomics studies are not really, a, they're kind of agnostic to which pepto, peptidoforms you're measuring, right? And so going forward, what, what I mean by next generation is Kind of paying more attention to the PTMs and the forms of the peptides and proteins we're measuring. And now if we can layer that, you know, specific information into our proteomic studies, will that increase the sensitivity and specificity of our proteomic biomarker studies? Uh, you're going to hear a lot about protein turnover today. Um, so we're interested in not only how, you know, the proteome remodels and how abundances change, but also how does protein dynamics change, right? And finally, um, 
uh, one really big area of research in the laboratory is focused on specific basic aging processes. So one of the things that happens with aging is that protein turnover changes, but another thing that happens is that these, um, uh, our tissues begin to accumulate these cells called senescent cells. And it turns out that um, they have really unique sets of proteins that they secrete and express on their surface that are, are really important to understand if we wanna therapeutically target them for age-related diseases. So like I said, today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about protein turnover. And I'd also like to give a little bit of uh, perspective on, you know, why do we care about um, aging, right? Well, it turns out, you know, aging is the greatest risk factor for most chronic diseases that we experience. Um, so uh, including the big killers like heart disease, cancer, and Alzheimer's disease. So as we age, our risk of susceptibility and our um, risk of getting all of these goes up over time, and particularly from middle life onwards, our um, susceptibility goes up dramatically and, and death follows a really similar trajectory, right? And we in the field uh, don't believe that this is a coincidence, right? There's something, um, some underlying processes happening in our cells over time that makes, uh, permits uh, these diseases to kind of take root and progress, right? And so these are the, the processes that we in the field like to study. And it turns out there are, there are several um, fundamental aging processes that we've now identified um, as potential drivers of multiple age-related diseases. And one of the ones, and the one that I'm gonna focus on today is that our cells lose the ability to maintain uh, proteostasis or protein homeostasis. There are others that uh, many of you are likely familiar with, um, including you know, DNA damage, uh, cellular senescence, um, and mitochondrial dysfunction. And all of these things are kind of driving aging at the cellular level and kind of permitting um, the progression uh, and of multiple diseases of aging. And in a way, uh, this is a good thing, right? Because uh, that means rather than trying to cure all of these diseases individually, we potentially have tar therapeutic targets, you know, um, more um, easily targeted, you know, single therapeutic targets that we can, we can focus on to mitigate multiple age-related diseases simultaneously. And it turns out uh, that is the case, at least in preclinical models. At this point, we've identified you know, multiple different interventions in mice that we can use uh, that target these basic aging processes that mi mitigate multiple age-related diseases simultaneously. This is a huge benefit to um, public health and society as a whole, and a huge economic benefit because, again, uh, targeting a single process is going to be easier than uh, trying to cure all of these individual uh, diseases simultaneously. So a few of the um, most well-studied interventions that have been identified to date are uh, dietary restriction, also known as calorie restriction, and treatment with a drug called rapamycin. And these are really conserved interventions that have worked in models from, you know, from invertebrate models all the way up to rodent models. And we also have evidence that, you know, some evidence that these will work in humans. And so today I'm gonna to talk about uh, one of the most well-studied pathways in aging. And this is a pathway targeted by both calorie restriction and rapamycin. Um, uh, which is the TOR pathway. So TOR is a nutrient sensing um, protein, and it's part of this uh, larger nutrient sensing complex called TORC1. And, um, and this pathway is essentially a proteostasis pathway. So it, it controls, it senses the amount of nutrients in a cell, uh, in the cell to tell the cell whether to um, grow and synthesize new proteins and whether to degrade proteins downstream, right? So the way that this works is it senses uh, incoming signals from, from um, nutrients like glucose, amino acids, and insulin, which will activate this complex. And that tells the cell, okay, we have lots of resources, let's synthesize a lot of proteins, and we don't need to degrade so many proteins. However, if you uh, inhibit this pathway, either um, by reducing these signals, and one way is to do that is restic to restrict calories, or pharmacologically with rapamycin, now you're telling the cell, okay, we don't have a lot of resources, so let's turn down protein synthesis, right? Because we need to only prioritize um, certain proteins that we need. And uh, let's turn up protein degradation and degrade the proteins we don't need into amino acids so that we can then um, use those for the proteins we prioritize those for the proteins we really need, right? So all of this is really good and well known for a long time now. Uh, but at the time when we were kind of studying this pathway and we were interested in asking about protein turnover, what we were wondering was, okay, so when we extend the lifespan uh, in animals with these interventions, you give them over a prolonged period of time, right? And you can't have a period of um, 
uh, reduced protein synthesis and increased degradation forever because you'll eventually run out of protein, right? So the question was, what is the new steady state the proteome eventually reaches? And what are the new protein dynamics? Which proteins are being uh, changed in turnover the most? And so to answer these questions, we applied um, metabolic labeling and mass spectrometry. So in order to do this experiment, what we did is we took uh, mice that were either uh, calorie restricted or rapamycin treated or untreated, both young and old, uh, and subjected them to their uh, respective treatments for about 10 weeks, after which we metabolically labeled these mice. So over this 17 day uh, metabolic labeling period, so what we did is we took their all of the leucine in their diet and it was substituted for a heavy isotope of leucine, right? So now when the mice eat the um, leucine from their diet, and it absorbs into their cells, when they synthesize new protein, it's gonna incorporate this heavier isotope of leucine, which we can then measure by mass spec downstream to tell us which uh, peptides and which proteins are newly synthesized, right? So uh, we then collect the tissues from these mice over this 17 day metabolic labeling period uh, from each group. Uh, we, we collect them for every time point. And then we analyze the samples by mass spectrometry. And in this case, we analyzed hearts because we were, we were interested in how these interventions were affecting their heart function and um, did MS analysis. We then get to what is probably the most difficult part of the pipeline, which is uh, actually doing the protein turnover analysis. So to do this, what we did is we used um, uh, a software that was created in-house by the Macos lab called Topograph. So this is a standalone software, which we use uh, that takes and looks at the data and looks at the relative signal coming from um, peptides that contain no heavy leucines, one heavy leucine, or more heavy leucines, right? And uses that to tell us, uh, to estimate the percentage of that peptide that's newly synthesized. We used in-house R scripts to then uh, look at what is the incorporation of newly synthesized peptide over time uh, for our different proteins. And then I uh, used first order regression, these first order equations to calculate the turnover rates and the half-lives, and then do statistical analysis of uh, differences between treatment groups, right? So how does turnover change with age? How does it change with treatment? And which biological pathways is it affecting? So we used uh, this ingenuity, ingenuity pathway analysis software to answer this question. And uh, what we were able to do in these studies was measure the turnover or the half-lives of hundreds of proteins. And what I'm going to do here is just summarize the results for you uh, very quickly um, from these early studies, because these are all published. But we were able to measure the half-lives of 100 of proteins. And I'm going to show you the results uh, compared relative to old control mice. So in the entire cardiac proteome, the median half-life of proteins is about 8.8 .8 days, right? And when we compare the young uh, uh, cardiac proteome to that, we see there's a small but non-significant difference. Um, that's, so the half-lives of proteins are increased about 3% um, to about 9.1 days. If we look at the distribution of proteins, um, the half-lives in young mice compared to old mice, where old mice is represented by this dotted line here, and here you can see the distribution of young compared to those. Um, you can see about half of them are reduced and half of them are increased. So there's not really a change in the overall half-life of proteins in young mice. However, if we take the old mice and now calorie restrict them, you can see that there's a clear shift in the half-life of the proteome. Most of the proteomes have an increased half-life and the median is increased by a 30, uh, significantly by about 30%. And this is perhaps not surprising because uh, if you're eating less, uh, if you're eating less, right, you need to make the proteins that you have last longer. So um, it's not really surprising. That's what's expected. And again, with cat, with rapamycin treated mice, we see something very similar. It hits the same pathway. So it also increases the median half lives of the proteome by 12% uh, up to about 9.8 days. So at the time when we did the study, one of the questions we had was, okay, so how are these mice able to maintain their proteins longer, right? Uh, and one of the ways we thought they were able to do this is by maintaining better quality proteins. So to kind of uh, test this hypothesis, we, um, we looked at total protein carbonylation, which is a kind of a surrogate measurement of protein quality, right? So that's telling us kind of how much overall oxidative damage is happening to proteins at the time. And what we found was that when we looked at this measure, uh, we see a reduction in uh, protein oxidation in the old mice that were treated with either calorie restriction or rapamycin, which kind of to us indicated um, that at least in part, um, one way that these old treated mice are able to maintain their proteins longer is by uh, make, uh, maintaining higher quality proteins, right? And preserving them from damage. So, um, but one of the things we were really interested in this study is which proteins were actually being affected the most by these interventions and how might that affect their heart function? So we did these ingenuity pathway analyses uh, focused on changes in half-life 
in old treated mice compared to old mice. And so here I'm showing you a, a, a heat map where everything that's in red shows an increase in half-life versus old control mice. And what you can appreciate is the top two pathways that were changed were mitochondrial function and TCA cycle. And this uh, to us indicated that perhaps there's a rejuvenation in mitochondrial metabolism in old mice that are given either intervention. And we, are, we were able to confirm this by using targeted metabolic profiling. And so what we saw was that if you take old mice and treat them with rapamycin, we see a decrease in uh, glycolysis and an increase in fatty acid oxidation and mitochondrial metabolism um, uh, back to more youthful levels. Uh, and this was correlated with improvements in heart function, right? So here's just a graph showing um, myocardial performance index and uh, a higher number is a bad thing. So here are the young mice, you can see their baseline measurements before and after the study. But in old mice, you see um, an increase in MPI, but in old mice that are given either treatment, you can kind of see a reduction in the MPI down to youthful levels. And so um, this is an old study that's published, but the reason I like to point this out is because it, it shows that including uh, protein half-lives as one um, component of a multidimensional study can be really useful and insightful because it can point you to a mechanism of a, of a, of a, a functional improvement in a mouse model. And furthermore, uh, we've done these protein turnover studies now, um, you know, over the last decade in multiple different mouse models of longevity and multiple tissues. So for example, we've done this in calorie restriction and rapamycin treatment, but also in mice that long-lived mice that overexpress this enzyme called catalase uh, targeted to the mitochondria. And we've looked at multiple tissues in all these studies. And one uh, common denominator across all of these is that um, in, in mouse models of longevity and longer, and longer health span, we also see longer proteome half-lives. So to this, this kind of indicated that maybe a longer proteome half-life is an indicator of better overall health. And these uh, studies were also confirmed by other labs. So the Hellerstein lab at University of, um, or at Berkeley, excuse me, uh, also showed the same thing in the long-lived Snell dwarf uh, transgenic mouse model. And they also confirmed um, the, our findings with rapamycin. And in fact, they showed that you know, different doses of rapamycin, which have different, um, give different amounts of lifespan extension, also um, incrementally increase uh, proteome half-lives. And even when you look at across different uh, organisms, so if you compare mice with their cousin, their long-lived cousin, the naked mole rat, uh, the naked mole rat, um, it lives 30 years compared to like three years for a mouse, right? And they have much longer half-lives. And this was work done by Sina Gamagami and Vera Gorbanova at University of Rochester and also Shelley Buffenstein at Calico Labs. And um, even more recently, it was shown that even the longest lived mammal, uh, you see the same thing. And in fact, in this uh, study, uh, Sina Gamagami, again, had, show, had done this really cool experiment where he'd taken cells from uh, many mammals with a, diverge, uh, a diverse range right, of maximal lifespans. Um, and then he measured the, the half-lives of these or the turnover rates of the proteins within the cells. And what he showed is that there's a really nice correlation between maximum half-life, I mean, maximum lifespan and the protein turnover rates. And it's a really beautiful correlation. And so I think, you know, what all, is this, all of this is to show is that uh, protein half-lives have a really um, interesting connection to health and lifespan. And measuring protein turnover and proteostasis provides important insights into the biology of aging and age-related diseases. Um, so we want this approach to be accessible to as many people as possible. The problem is uh, that these studies are not very easy to do. So essentially you can break down these experiments into two phases. Uh, one is the metabolic labeling phase. And this is when you take your organism that you're studying, you metabolically label them. Uh, for example, feeding mice heavy leucine and then collect their tissues at different uh, time points. And then you analyze those by mass spec analysis. Um, but the real bottleneck in doing these studies is in the data analysis phase. And the reason for this is not, um, not a lot of labs have the, uh, a computational pipeline in place that allows you to accurately calculate protein turnover rates. And those that do often create them in-house and we were guilty of the same thing, of course. Uh, so what we had done is we taken our in-house uh, computational pipeline and um, completely uh, rewrote it and repackaged it into an R-based tool called Turnover and um, made this as an external tool for the Skyline Proteomics software platform. 
And the idea here is that we wanted to make um, you know, the, the turnover computational pipeline accessible to more researchers. So other, re other proteomic researchers can conduct these studies, particularly people who are familiar with the Skyline software platform. And of course, we did this in, uh, in collaboration with the uh, Skyline core development team with Brendan and Nick, um, and also Mike McCoss, who's the PI of uh, the lab from which uh, Skyline came. And um, just to give you an idea now of what a turnover analysis uh, workflow looks like, for those who are familiar with Skyline already, uh, you can now um, set up your Skyline document in the way you normally would. And now uh, within the Skyline software, they've added a really useful feature that enables us to do protein turnover analysis. And that's called uh, this feature called permute isotope modification. So you can now, uh, when you set up your Skyline document, you can simply click this feature and it, it adds to your document all the different isotopal logs of peptide that contain your heavy label. So for example, when we did our studies, we looked at, we fed our mice heavy leucine. So here's a peptide that contains three heavy leucines. And in order to calculate turnover rates, we didn't need to know how much of that signal is coming from the unlabeled form of the peptide, how much of it comes from the singly labeled form, the doubly labeled form, and the fully labeled form, right? So now that's exactly what this, um, this new um, function does. So it populates your uh, document with the, uh, the XICs for all of the different isotopologs of this peptide. Here's unlabeled, fully labeled, um, singly labeled, and doubly labeled. And that allows us to do the isotopolog analysis to calculate turnover rates. Once you've added this and once you've populated those into your document, you can open the turnover tool. Um, and it's a pretty simple uh, graphical user interface where you just have to specify a few different things here, uh, including the labeling enrichment of your diet and a few different filtering criteria, as well as which treatment groups do you want to compare statistically, right? And then you push OK, and then the turnover rate, uh, the turnover um, tool basically runs through this whole entire computational um, um, series of computations and then provides you with your uh, data, both uh, graphical and numerical outputs of your data. Uh, one of the biggest benefits of, uh, you know, putting this tool in Skyline is that you get all of the benefits of using Skyline, right? So uh, I just wanted to point out, you know, some of the, the benefits of using Skyline for these kind of analysis. Um, Skyline is a really nice graphical user interface um, platform that gives you a lot of control of the data going into your analysis, right? So here's an example of what a Skyline workspace might look like. And on the left here, you have the list of all of your target peptides, um, proteins, you, for your precursors and your transitions. If you select one of these, then you can uh, look at the extracted ion chromatogram here in the middle, and you can see you know, what it looks like. Um, and this is important because this is the actual peak areas that you take and, and use for the quantification of your uh, peptides. And in the case of protein turnover analysis, you're taking these peak areas as well as the, the peak areas corresponding to the heavier version of your peptide and comparing those. So this is, you know, accurately uh, integrating these and uh, selecting these is very important to have an, uh, uh, you know, um, accurate calculation of turnover rates. Um, and within Skyline, you can also modify which peak areas you're choosing, uh, manually curate the peak integration boundaries and just have a little bit of control over the data. You can compare the uh, retention times and the peak areas across all of the different replicates in your data, you know, just as a way to QC and make sure you're choosing the right peaks. Skyline also has these advanced uh, features like index retention time alignment and M profit peak scoring that further, you know, allow you to have better quality uh, data going into your analysis. Uh, so here's what a, a metabolically labeling, you know, heavy leucine data uh, might look like in Skyline. So here's an example peptide from aspartate aminotransferase. And you can easily appreciate that this peptide that contains one leucine, uh, at day th three days of metabolic labeling, you see mostly light signal, but at 30 days, you see mostly heavy signal. And if you look at the XICs over our different time points, you can appreciate there's an, a relative increase in the heavy signal in blue versus the light signal in red over our subsequent time points. So, and this is important because these relative ratios are gonna be important to calculating uh, the turnover rates of the peptide. And of course, Skyline is vendor agnostic. So we can extract this data um, uh, from uh, a data set collected on the triple TOF mass spectrometer uh, in muscle and Orbitrap uh, mass spec uh, on the liver. And, this is the same peptide collected from you know, both the different tissues, two different data sets, and it looks, you can see the same thing. 
So now I do want to talk a little bit more about the tool itself, because this is really the meat of, you know, this is the work that we actually did to make this happen. So I want to go through the computational pipeline of this uh, turnover tool. Uh, this turnover tool has to uh, go through several critical uh, computational steps in order to accurately calculate protein turnover rates. And this all starts with actually um, calculating the amount of signal that's coming from peptides that are unlabeled, uh, have zero heavy leucine, a one heavy leucine, or two heavy leucine. So if you look at, um, this is a, you know, a theoret theoretical example of what a peptide signal might look like. So you'll have its uh, different isotope envelopes and signal that's coming from the unlabeled form, the singly labeled form, and the doubly labeled form. Well, you can also appreciate that when you look at this data that um, the isotope envelopes are also overlapping a bit, right? So some of the zero heavy labeled signal is coming in, um, is overlapping with the one heavy labeled signal. So we really do need to correct for, uh, for this when we do our computations, right? Or um, in order to prevent sy uh, systematic overestimation of heavy label enrichment. And um, what, give, what basically gives rise to these isotope envelope is the fact that uh, peptides are made out of hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and sulfur. And all of these different uh, atoms, to some extent, um, their heavy versions occur in nature, right? And uh, this will be reflected in these isotopic envelopes. So for example, um, you know, deuterium, it's hydrogen, uh, hydrogen two here, occurs at a frequency of 0.015% in nature. Carbon-13 happens a little over 1% of the time. But when you have a peptide that's composed of hundreds of these atoms, right, then the, the relative signal contribution of the heavier isotopes um, of the peptide are going to be greater and greater. And that's what gives rise to these isotopic envelopes. So um, uh, one of the things the tool does is now separates out the relative signal coming from the zero heavy label, one heavy label, and two heavy label peaks. But of course, when you're looking at the data uh, itself, you don't see this color coding. So it's not as easy, just as easy as drawing these lines, right? We need a way to do this computationally. So um, what we can do, because we know the sequence uh, from the peptide sequences, we know uh, their elemental composition and their molecular formula. So we can actually calculate their theoretical isotope envelopes. So if I'm going to show you an example here of a peptide that contains two heavy leucines and how we might deconvolute the difference, you know, the, the relative signal coming from zero, one, and two heavy leucine peaks. So for this peptide, uh, here's the, uh, it contains 54 carbons, 95 hydrogens, et cetera. And based on this molecular formula and the frequency, the natural frequency of the heavy isotopes of all these atoms, we can actually calculate the theoretical iso um, isotope envelopes. So here's the isotope envelope for a zero heavy leucine a version of this peptide, the one heavy leucine and the two heavy leucine version of this peptide. And you can appreciate that some of these masses, there is some overlap, right? So you'll need to, this will help you to deconvolute the signal. Over here, what I'm showing is a simulation of some of the data you might actually observe, right? So when you observe the data, it'll look like something like this. And this is some combination of the zero, one and two heavy leucine peaks. And it turns out that we can deconvolute this uh, using a method that was published way back in 1966 by Brahman et al. So um, these problems were figured out a long time ago. And they showed uh, this least square, squared analysis approach uh, to deconvolute um, these uh, multi-isotope mass spectra. And uh, they had shown this in, of course, more simple molecules than peptides, but we can apply, apply the same molecules to peptides. So all we need to know is uh, you know the relative, the theoretical um, uh, intensities of the unlabeled peaks, uh, the singly labeled peaks, and the doubly labeled peaks, and then our observed data, and we could use this kind of matrix math equation to tell us that okay, half of this total signal comes from the um, zero heavy leucine, a quarter of it comes from the one heavy leucine, and um, a quarter of it comes from the two heavy leucine version of this peptide. So, and that's uh, the very first step in the computational pipeline. And this is before we even calculate turnover rates. So basically what the tool does is that calculate, it's at the, the very st first step we need to do is to actually calculate what is the relative amount of signal coming from zero, one, and two heavy uh, leucine versions of our peptide. And now that we know that, we can actually go forward and calculate our protein turnover rates. So, um, 
I'm going to now talk about one of the most important steps in calculating, uh, accurately calculating protein turnover um, that I'd like to highlight, which um, the turnover tool goes through, which is um, um, correcting to the amino acid enrichment in the, um, uh, in the precursor pool. So to illustrate this, um, here's a theoretical example where say you see five different peptides, five different um, copies of this peptide that contains one leucine, right? If two of them contain a heavy leucine and three of them contain the light version of the leucine, it's tempting to say that 40% of them are labeled, so 40% of them are newly synthesized. And you would be correct if 100% of the leucine that was floating around the cell uh, was heavy labeled, then when, you, when the cell made to, when it was synthesizing new peptides, these two had to be the newly synthesized one. But in reality, um, you never, when you're metabolically labeling an organism, your precursor pool never reaches 100% enrichment. So you'll see something like 40% uh, of heavy leucines floating around in the cell. And if that's the case, then only 40% of the time will a newly synthesized protein incorporate a heavy, and 60% of the time, a newly synthesized protein will incorporate a light, right? So if you had a 40% precursor pool enrichment, you would call this 100% uh, newly synthesized protein. So um, this all comes down to the fact that when you do these studies, there will be newly synthesized proteins that are not incorporating your heavy label. And you really need, it's really important to correct to this if you wanna uh, accurate, accurately calculate protein turnover rates. So the way that we, um, but when we do mass spec and we see this data, uh, we can observe directly what we see on the peptide level here, but we cannot directly observe what we see in the precursor pool, right? We have to, um, uh, we have to be able to find some way to back calculate that. And the way that we do that is by focusing on peptides that contain two or more heavy leucines. So I'm gonna give you an example of a, a peptide. Say you have a peptide with two heavy leucines and you assume you have a 40% precursor pool just as in the situation I just um, described on the previous slide, how would you calculate um, what relative amount of signal you'd expect to see from the unlabeled form and the singly labeled form and the doubly labeled form? So here's the peptide with two heavy with two leucines. So the chances of the first leucine being uh, uh, light are 60%. Again, this is a 40% precursor pool. So 60% chance that it's light. 60% uh, chance that the second one's light. So the, there's a 36% chance that uh, your newly synthesized peptide will have no heavy label in it whatsoever. Uh, then you can calculate the same thing for uh, the version of the peptide containing one heavy label. So 60% chance that the first leucine is light, 40% chance that the second one is heavy, that's 24%. You could also swap the positions and you get a 24%. So about 40% of the signals uh, from newly synthesized peptide is expected to be um, have just one of the heavy leucines. And then 16% of the total signal is expected to have both leucines heavy. So this is the distribution coming from uh, newly synthesized uh, peptide, right? So you have to appreciate that a good amount of this signal is going to be completely unlabeled. So this is how you would calculate um, if you know the precursor pool, what distribution do you expect? But when we see the data, we see um, the peaks, right? And we need to back calculate what is the precursor pool. So we would see something like this. So how do we back calculate the precursor pool enrichment? So uh, I'm gonna run off the same example here and show you. So when we observe the data, we'll have you know, the, the isotope envelope for the unlabeled peaks, the singly labeled peaks here, so that contain uh, heavy light or light heavy, and also the doubly labeled peaks. So what we can do now is for a two leucine peptide, we can actually um, calculate what is the expected distribution of signal we expect to see uh, at different precursor pool um, enrichments. So we could start at 0% and increment this all the way down to 100% and calculate what are the theoretical distributions we'd ex expect to see at all of these different precursor pool enrichments. So if we had 0%, it would all be light. If we had 40%, um, the distribution would look like this. At 80%, it would look like this. And 100, it would all be heavy, right? So what we can do is we now calculate the theoretical distribution, step these from 0 to 100%, and then choose the closest matching one to our observed distributions and say, OK, that's our precursor enrichment, right? So now we can take this distribution, overlay it on our data, and say that all of these colored regions in red, 
uh, brown and beige, this is all signal coming from newly synthesized uh, peptide. What's left in black here is pre-existing peptide. So now that we know these numbers, we can calculate the newly synthesized peptide signal over the total peptide signal and give, it, and give us a precursor pool corrected estimate of newly synthesized protein. So now we know 84% of our total peptide is newly synthesized, right? So this is really important because it now allows us to um, calculate a, uh, an accurate fraction of newly synthesized protein. Uh, the turnover tool also generates, you know, summaries, summary reports of um, the analysis at different steps in this computational pipeline. So here's uh, what the data looks like for precursor pool enrichment. So if I take that data I showed you earlier, uh, looking at um, calorie restriction in, in the mouse tissues, uh, you can appreciate that precursor pool enrichment increases over time, which makes sense. You're the longer they're on the label, the, the more amino acid precursor they have in their precursor pools. And also that there's a significant difference in control mice versus calorie restricted mice. So doing this correction is extremely important because there's already a difference um, arising in precursor enrichment between your different treatment groups. And you don't want this to be the driving, if you don't correct to this, then this could be artifactually driving the difference that you're seeing between your two different treatment groups. Um, and the reason that it's really important to correct to the precursor pool is illustrated nicely here. So I stole this figure from a, uh, um, a paper from the McCoss lab uh, for the original topograph tool. And what this does is it nicely illustrates that if you do account for the enrichment of amino acid of heavy label in the precursor pool, uh, you would see something like this line, right? Uh, because you're taking into account the fact that unlabeled signal is contributing to newly synthesized peptide, so it's higher. And if you don't take the, into that into account, you have this lower line. And if you calculate protein half-life uh, from both of these lines, uh, what you get is in the case when you don't um, correct for precursor enrichment, you calculate a half-life of 13 days about. And if you do correct for it, you calculate a half-life of six days. So this is more than a two-fold difference. So it really nicely illustrates the point that uh, it's extremely important to do this correction if you want to accurately calculate turnover rates. Uh, so now what the tool does is it does this um, based on peptides that contain two or more leucines. It does uh, this calculation for all of them. And now it does the regressions of newly synthesized protein over time. And from this, we can directly calculate the protein half-lives. So in addition to calculating half-lives, the tool you know, generates re graphical reports of your data. So both summary reports and uh, protein by protein reports. So again, I did an analysis of the calorie restriction data I showed you earlier. And here you can see on the left, is the enrichment of newly synthesized protein in the global proteome. And you can appreciate this increases over time over our subsequent time points. And again, in calorie restricted mice, there's a significantly uh, lower uh, enrichment of newly synthesized protein over time as expected. Um, we also generate the protein by protein reports. So here are regressions of new, new protein synthesis for four different mitochondrial proteins. And calorie restricted mice, you see a slower incorporation of new proteins in blue versus in control mice in red. And these are significantly different. So in addition to the, uh, the, to the, um, the graphics or the graphical reports generated by the tool, we also produce numerical reports, right? Of all of the p-values, full changes and half-lives for your different treatment groups. We've uh, compared the turnover tool to the you know, existing gold standard tools to calculate turnover rates. So as I mentioned, we had previously used this topograph tool, which nicely um, calculates precursor pool corrected uh, rates of new protein synthesis as well. And we've compared the two different tools and we see that there's a pretty nice correlation. We haven't fully explained all of these outliers, but in part, you know, we think that these are explained by the fact that you have a little bit more control or, and curation of the data that goes into your analysis when you use turnover. So some of these might actually be, are actually things that are more accurate uh, with the new tool. And uh, now what we'd like to do going forward. So we've now, uh, we've submitted the paper, but the tool is up in the, in the tool store. And uh, as soon as it's published, we'll have the tutorials, um, uh, the Skyline tutorials also published for this tool, but I am happy to share it earlier on if anyone's interested in testing out the tool. Uh, and our next step in terms of method development is that we would like to make this tool compatible with different types of metabolic labels, so um, and the, uh, such as heavy water, 
And the reason for this is that um, moving forward, it would be nice to be able to do these kind of studies in Skyline in humans. Uh, however, when you do these metabolic labeling studies in um, humans, you're very limited um, by the, the length of your labeling experiment, right? So in humans, when you wanna do a, a protein turnover experiment with amino acids, for example, you have to infuse them uh, in, you know, intravenously with the amino acid. And you can only do that for a matter of hours, right? Uh, you can't do that for like days or weeks like you do with mice. Um, so you can't really capture longer lived proteins when you do these studies with amino acids, but you can uh, do a study in people where you give them a bottle of heavy water and ask them, you know, bottles of heavy water and ask them to drink a certain amount every day. And you can have them carry on like that for weeks. So, you know, we're hoping in the future to make this compatible with heavy water so that we can do this in human studies. But with our current tool, what were some of the things that we're really um, interested in doing is answering questions specifically about, um, you know, certain age-related diseases and how protein turnover is uh, really, is um, changing in those. So for example, one study, which I won't have time to talk about today, uh, we're examining, you know, what is the role of protein turnover in age-related muscle atrophy uh, in model and mice that are aging and also mice that are protected from muscle atrophy. So will that reveal which, um, you, know, the, you know, which proteins are, are, are more important to synthesize uh, in order to prevent age-related muscle atrophy? How do PTMs affect protein turnover, right? So, you know, multiple different kinds of PTMs happen on, um, on lysine and compete with ubiquitin on those. So how would, might those affect turnover rates? And uh, going back to what I said earlier, are longer protein half-lives potentially a biomarker for interventions that extend, extend lifespan? So we know longer half-life is a really good indicator um, of longevity and longer life, but can it also predict whether an intervention is going to give longer life. So this would be really interesting for us to examine going forward. And with that, I'd like to thank um, all of the labs who were involved in the work I, I uh, presented today, particularly the Schilling lab and Birgit Schilling. Um, I did most of this work while in her lab as a postdoc. And Cameron Werfritz, who's a research associate who had done a lot of the coding. Um, the Macos lab and the Skyline core development team, of course, and Ali Marsh, who is an intern that uh, created the graphical user interface. And of course, the Rabinovich lab, who had, um, who's uh, generated the data we used to perform uh, um, this analysis in my lab at the NIA. And uh, I am hiring postdocs. So if anybody, any trainees out there are interested in uh, developing tools like this, feel free to reach out. And I'd like to thank uh, all of you for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Nate. That was, that was really great. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot. And yeah, I wish I was younger so I can join your group too. Um, <laughs> to, I think it's gonna be some really exciting work going on your, on your, on your group. So um, maybe I can start off with, with a question um, and you touched a little bit on it in terms of the use of um, other labeling strategies to maybe transition this to humans, but also maybe even to, to increase the coverage in, in, in mouse studies, or even the cellular studies. Um, is there a particular reason for using leucine um, or would it be beneficial to use additional heavy amino acids in there or that complicate the isotopic profile and overlaps too much in terms of uh, extracting the data computationally afterwards? Yeah. It would, I think there is, um, well, the reason we chose leucine, you can you could use, I think, theoretically multiples, and it would be a little more complicated, but I think it would be doable. The reason we went with leucine um, is because it's one of the, it's an essential amino acid. So first of all, so you know, um, all of the leucine in the cell is coming from the diet directly that you're feeding the animal, right? And they're not synthesizing it in some other way in their cells. And also it's the most common amino acid. Um, so you'll have more peptides that have multiple leucines on them. So you could, you know, for example, if you do a, like a SILAC study, which guarantees you have just one, one, every peptide contains at least one label, um, that won't necessarily be sufficient because for back calculating precursor pool, we need to have a ver you know, um, a number of observations of the peptide containing two or more heavy label in the same peptide. Right, so uh, leucine just increases our probability of having those peptides, which allow us to do the precursor pool measurement. Okay, interesting. Um, also, in terms of heavy water, do you 
uh, would I know that with hydrogen deuterium exchange experiments, you have back exchange, quick back exchange. How would that work in, in, in this scenario? Would you somehow quench with low pH and cold, uh, low temperatures? Um, what would be the strategy of this? Yeah, so I don't fully understand the how um, water metabolizes into uh, <laughs> amino acids and peptides. So my understanding is that once it's um, synthesized into the protein, there are certain fixed areas where the hydrogens can no longer exchange. And those are the ones we're looking at. So you can, during intermediary metabolism, uh, a low level of um, you know, heavy water in the cell will be doing yeah. this exchange. And then once it's actually synthesized into a protein, there are certain ones that no longer get exchanged is my understanding, but I wouldn't quote me on that. And so uh, these, these rates and these, now, these um, proportions are kind of already, have already been calculated and they should be able to use to calculate turnover rates. But uh, I should, uh, you know, I should follow that up with saying, this is, uh, my understanding is completely theoretical there, but others have done heavy water studies in mice. And um, we've compared our half-life estimates with those studies um, the, from heavy leucine, and we get very similar data. So, you know, I'm relatively confident that, um, you know, this is a good, you know, another good approach, but I've yeah. not, I don't have much experience with it myself. Yeah. I suppose you will probably be able to to measure the half lives of the faster turnover turnover proteins, but maybe struggle a little bit with the longer ones um, with this approach. But um, certainly something something interesting to consider. Um, another question that they, that came up is about the initial um, uh, heavy labeled uh, pool, um, because as you highlighted in your presentation, that's quite important in working out what is the actual turnover rate. So how, how do you actually figure it out uh, to start with? Like how much of your, you know, your, if your, if your starting pool is actually um, heavy labeled? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, basically we do the correction up front before we even, um, we do it at the, you know, at the peptide level before we even calculate the pools. So we can calculate the theoretical contribution of the, um, you know, the heavy, heavier isotopes of a peptide based on its um, molecular formula and the number of hydrogens, carbons, oxygens, and sulfurs it contains, and are the known frequencies of the heavier isotopes of those elements. Um, we can theoretically calculate and deconvolute the relative contribution of uh, the heavy and light signal from our data. Yeah. That, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, okay, I don't see any more questions. Um, if anybody wants to post a question, we still have a little bit of time. Um, I think for me, what's, what's also interesting is that when we study disease uh, from a proteomics perspective, we're always looking at up and down regulation. And, and one of your, your final comments in your last slide was that actually uh, the rate of, of making a protein around the absolute abundance of it could be actually a biomarker for disease, which is, which is a really different way of thinking, thinking when it comes to um, looking at, at, at um, disease-related biomarkers, which is really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's like a dimension that people don't really look at in terms of biomarkers. So I think it would be interesting to, to try. You know, the thing is getting the perfect experiment there is a little difficult because you have to have an experiment where you can, you know, treat and see the turnover rate of something, but then also see if there's a, a health outcome, you know, observe until the end to see if it, the change in turnover also correlates with the change in the health outcome. So, you know, we're, you know, we're just in the talking stages, but it would be fun to do this like, um, in a more like longitudinal type study in mice where you can take biopsies and follow, continue to follow them after you've measured their change in turnover rates, you know? Yeah, definitely, definitely. So we have two questions that come up from, from, uh, from Roman Saxon. Uh, first of all, it says, great talk, Nate. Uh, would it be theoretically possible to use arginine lysine for labeling and to back calculate the precursor poor enrichment using peptides with misc cleavages? Oh yes, that's a good, yeah, that's, I think that's a good way to do it. Yeah, because those peptides will, the peptides um, will contain 
uh, with the MISC cleavages will contain multiple of the label, right? Multiple copies of the label in them. Yeah, definitely. That's a great idea. Yeah, I think uh, there was a follow on that would precursor poor enrichment estimation be less critical in cell culture experiments where you can reach 90% enrichment and beyond. Yes, yeah. Hi, Roman, by the way. Um, that's a good question too. Uh, yes, uh, the, this tool is mostly meant to be used for you know, whole organism studies. So the thing is when you do normal SILAC experiments in cells, uh, you can pretty much saturate, like you said, saturate the precursor pool with your label. You just completely bathe your cells in that label and within hours. Um, you know, I saw a paper from Sinagamagami that kind of even showed the kinetics of how fast the enrichment occurs. And it seems to happen within hours that the precursor pool is fully, fully labeled. So you can kind of not even worry about precursor pool enrichment when you do SILAC studies. Fantastic. Um, I think this is all we have at the moment. Um, so um, unless something else quickly comes in, uh, I would like to thank you, Nate, again. It was really informative and I think you're doing some fantastic research and um, yeah, uh, thanks for, thanks a lot. Roman also says thanks a lot and uh, we'll chat soon. And thank you everyone for joining us today. We'll see you in the, less, in the next uh, episode. Thank you very much. Cheers. Bye guys. Bye. -bye.